Yep. Welcome to November. It is November. November's CXM at MSU monthly roundtable. Um, I'm gonna. I'm really pleased to turn it over to Esther Meffin, who is now unattached, I believe, <laughs> but yeah. but he is attached to CXM at MSU, and he's wearing a CXM at MSU polo polo shirt. So, Alistair, um, maybe you can go ahead and explain our process to the people who are new to the game and then introduce today's roundtable speaker. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so as Tom mentioned, uh, I am currently uh, looking. Um, however, um, I've been in a customer experience, customer success uh, arena now for almost 15 years. Um, so I'm really excited to host this month's uh, November roundtable. So for those of you who are just uh, new to us, uh, we do a little bit of a different format than most webinars. Um, we do a 15 minute lightning round where our speaker will take us through his, his or her topic. Uh, we'll learn about that. And then at the end of their at the end of that, they'll then give you an application that you're gonna take into a small group format. So we'll send you into breakout rooms of three to four people and uh, you'll go through and apply what you've just learned uh, to, uh, to a mural board. And you'll give us uh, three, two to three suggestions on how you think uh, we can resolve today's topic. Um, we'll bring you back. We're going to actually let you vote on what you think is, are the best resolutions to that. Um, and we'll spend about five minutes doing that. And then we'll have a group discussion where the speaker and I will sort of pick and choose which, which pieces we wanna talk about specifically. And of course, uh, we welcome any questions from the group uh, as, we, uh, as we go through that. So for today's topic, um, I'm very excited uh, to introduce uh, Tom DeVries. Uh, Tom, you can always correct me. Um, he's the founder and CEO of, of Crooks, a powerful, simple customer experience system and the co-founder of Thoughtful, an award-winning CX strategy and innovation firm. He has led innovation initiatives with clients on six continents and a variety of industries. He's worked with a lot with lots of great businesses you've never heard of and a bunch you have, including Air New Zealand, Amway, Best Buy, Ford, Google, and many more. Tom is a hybrid business and design professional who is passionate passionately curious about people, the power of technology, the potential of business to improve society, and the human experiences that happen where they intersect. So I'm very excited to introduce Tom to everyone, and I'll let him take things away. All right, how's everybody doing? Most of you are awesome. muted, I imagine. <laughs> hey, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Today our topic is CX is stuck. It's intentionally provocative. Uh, some of you probably disagree and some of you probably agree and are glad we're gonna start talking about it. No matter where you land on that spectrum, my goal is to leave everybody walking away with some sort of practical thing they can use in their business practice, in their personal lives or whatever. But I also want to start to stimulate a conversation of at least open your mind to the idea that maybe we are stuck as CX practitioners. Maybe we need to dislodge and we aren't moving forward fast enough. And we're going to unravel that topic and challenge you a little bit today. So uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen and we'll dive into things. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to do this in three steps. Step one is we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about what it means to be stuck and how we behave when we get stuck as people and organizations. Step two, we'll introduce a practical tool. And step three, we'll apply that practical tool or at least start to, to the shared challenge of getting CX unstuck. We clearly won't solve that today, but we'll at least get uh, some discussion going and uh, get people's minds thinking about the challenge. All right, so we all know what it is like to be stuck. We've all been stuck in some way, shape, or form. And I want to start with a story about how I got stuck a couple of years ago in a minivan on a desolate trail in Yosemite National Park on a two-track. So the story begins, I was on a guy's trip, and we set the guy's trip up 
because we wanted to see the wild side of Yosemite, not the parking lots that they direct you to, the viewpoints, we've seen all that. We wanted to actually get behind the scenes. And we set up an agenda and a plan accordingly. Now, when we arrived at the airport, the rental car company informed us that the four by four SUV we had reserved was not available. They couldn't honor the reservation. As you can imagine, this, this threw a hitch in our trip. So we asked a bunch of other rental car companies what they had and nobody else had four by four SUVs either. So we took the minivan. They told us they would hook us up with a minivan. And they felt like they were really doing us a, a service because they, they, they clearly didn't understand our intent, but, but that's a story for another day. Uh, the next morning, we had a decision to make. The plan was to access the famous Mariposa Sequoia Grove, but we didn't wanna go in the normal way. We wanted to go in the back way on this desolate two track. And all we had was a minivan, but we were a group of four men approaching our midlife crisis. And so as you can imagine, we, we decided to go anyway. And, and we actually made it farther than I thought we would. We made it a couple of miles up this desolate trail. And that's when it happened. All of a sudden, as the driver, I bottomed that van out on a giant route. And the front tires were floating. I knew they were floating. I could feel it in the instant. But every instinct inside of me was saying, hit the gas, Tom. Hit the gas, Tom. And so that's what I did. I hit the gas. And the engine roared and the tires spun. And we went absolutely nowhere. Now, this is significant because I think it's symptomatic of how we behave anytime we get stuck in life as individuals or organizations. Our instincts tell us, even if we know better, to do the exact thing that got us stuck in the first place, only more aggressive. And it rarely works. Often, it even gets us more stuck than we were at first. So we hopped out of the van and looked at it. And we had to laugh because it was a giant teeter-totter. It, it just, you could press on part of it and it would tilt back and forth. And we had a pretty good chuckle at first, and, and we started trying to solve the problem. We started talking about how do we get this van back on track and moving up the trail towards the grove. And we tried a few things that didn't work. And then the strangest thing happened that I didn't realize till later. At some point, about 20 minutes into this debacle, the conversation shifted away from solutions to get unstuck that kept us going up the trail and without ever talking about it, all the ideas were giving up on our destination. They were willing to let go of where we were going, and we were just going to get unstuck, even if it meant abandoning what we were trying to accomplish. This, too, I think is very symptomatic of what happens when we get stuck as people, teams, organizations. If we're stuck for too long, we give up on our destination, especially if it's not noble. And, and what a catastrophe if we do give up on a destination, if it's actually worth pursuing. Far too often, we get stuck and we just turn around and settle for getting unstuck. Now, I can't help but draw a parallel between how I felt that day on this trail in this minivan when we got stuck and how I feel as a customer experience professional, it's going on almost 20 years in the field in some way, shape, or form. I think we're stuck. If you're new to this, you might not feel that way, but the longer you're involved, you might start to feel that way. It seems to me that for about 30 years, a group of really smart, really brave people have been blazing a trail of customer experience. They've been coming up with theories. They've been testing those theories. They've been turning them into tools and methodologies, applying them with different organizations, often successfully, sometimes not successfully, always learning, iterating, improving. And man, have we come a long way. What an effort. But now, even though customer experience is gaining a huge amount of momentum, Lots of new initiatives are being written and developed by organizations all over the world on a daily or weekly basis. The problem we're facing is not enough of them are successful. Not enough of them actually deliver 
hard business impact and hard impact into users' lives. They're happening. They're happening all the time. But the primary narrative is dangerously close to being CX efforts don't work more often than not. And we need to flip the script. We need to get to a position where when an organization initiates any sort of customer experience effort, where, whether it's a project or an enterprise initiative, they deliver impact far more often than not. And I think we're stuck short of that right now. And so we're gonna unpack that in a few minutes. Now, there are some great things about being stuck. The first great thing about being stuck is it's extremely common. It happens to all of us. We get stuck in our personal lives. We get stuck on business challenges. We get stuck as teams, organizations. We get stuck as industries. And we even get stuck as society at large. It happens to everybody. The second great thing about being stuck is that it's been happening forever. People have been getting stuck since the beginning of time. And better yet, since the beginning of time, or at least thousands of years ago, they've been using a methodology to get unstuck. And the third great thing about being stuck is when people have gotten stuck and they apply this methodology, they typically don't just get unstuck, they unlock a surge of progress towards their destinations. The methodology is called first principles or first principles thinking. And its first recorded history, at least that I can find, is with Aristotle in the year, about the year 350 BC, when he said, for we do not think that we know a thing until we are acquainted with its primary conditions or first principles, and have carried our analysis as far as its simplest elements. So what Aristotle is saying here is, we don't understand anything in this world, because it just kind of, things just happen. And every now and then we need to tear them apart, and we need to break them down to their pieces, and then figure out which of those pieces are absolutely essential, and then figure out which of them we can get rid of, and then be willing to rethink how they should be put together moving forward. And Aristotle put this idea out in the world, and lots of people have formally and informally picked it up throughout the course of the last few thousand years. I don't wanna make this a history lesson, but it's important that we get a connection with how every single one of these people on screen and thousands more got stuck and used this methodology to get unstuck. So here's about a thousand years of history and hopefully about a minute. Aristotle applied first principles to get philosophy unstuck. Nicholas Copernicus debunked the myth that the sun revolved around the earth rather than the other way around. Isaac Newton got society unstuck when he used it to define the laws of motion and gravity. Frederick Winslow Taylor used it to dislodge labor productivity during the Industrial Revolution. Pablo Picasso felt stuck when art became too literal, so he used it to abstract art into cubism. John Coltrane felt trapped in the linear nature of sheet music, so he broke it into modules that empowered musicians to compose unique music together and on the fly. Margaret Hamilton used first principles to keep computers from crashing when they encountered unknown error states so that the Apollo 11 moon landing could happen. Warren Buffett still uses it to this day to break down how he invests in companies. Elon Musk used it to identify the insanity that had been going on for decades of throwing rockets away every time we send one to space. And Lin-Manuel Miranda deconstructed the elements of a musical and put them together in a unique style with a far broader appeal to create the most successful Broadway show in history. Every one of these people got stuck. Every one of these people used first principles in some way, shape, or form to get unstuck, and they all changed the world. Now it's our turn, and not every initiative needs to change the world. It's actually a really simple methodology, but we've got to get out of our old ways of thinking, and it's structured to help us do exactly that. Now, to temper your expectations, you're not going to be an expert at this the first time you do it. It takes some practice, but it's surprisingly simple. And with a little bit of practice, pretty much anybody can get really good at it. We're gonna build this out, the five steps really quickly, and then you're gonna apply it to a challenge in a few minutes. So as we build this out, we're not gonna apply it to a world-changing challenge, but a really simple one. So the first step in first principles is to frame the challenge. And you want to frame it with a really simple statement, like a one-liner, a phrase, 
something like this. And we're going to build our example around the idea of not, there are not enough hotel rooms in town. Some of you may have encountered this at some point. So the key to a good challenge frame is you're going to start by generating a few of them. You're going to look at your challenge and write one and another and another and another and look at them and say, which of these do we want to build out through the other four steps? Now, you might end up doing two or three, but you've got to do one at a time, and a whole team has to be focused on the same one simultaneously. The second step is to establish the essential elements of that challenge. So here, you're going to start by writing down all of the elements of that challenge, and then you're going to get rid of any that are not absolutely essential. See, one of the things that's essential here to the success of the method methodology is we're removing complexity from it. We're getting rid of everything that doesn't have to be there. And in the example, that looks something like this. Well, we need a place to stay and we need a way to book. The third step is to define assumptions. In the example, we might write statements like this. Travelers stay in hotels owned by hotel companies and travelers book with hotels either directly or through online agencies. These are the unwritten rules that everyone follows and expects is true, even though they're really not. They're the rut we've dug ourselves into and everybody's bought into. So now the fourth step is to break them explicitly. We wanna break those assumptions. We wanna break free of the conventional wisdoms about the challenge itself and its elements. So we do that by writing a series of what if statements. The what if statements in this example end up being things like, what if travelers stayed in homes that were owned by local residents? You see how it explicitly breaks the assumption above it. And what if travelers and hosts connect via an online marketplace? Breaks, explicitly breaks the assumption above. And you could write a bunch more. The fifth and final step of the first principles method is reassembling these essential elements with their, their now broken conventions, their new conventions, and putting them back together in interesting ways. And you're probably not going to do it right the first time. You'll try a few different configurations. And in this specific instance, it turns out that this isn't just an example at all. It's a case study. And it's a real story. It's not that long ago, Brian Chesky and friends were sitting around in their apartment in San Francisco, and they were barely making rent. And there was a design conference happening in town, and there weren't enough hotel rooms available. So Brian and his friends started breaking the problem down through a process similar to this. And the end result was some transformative experiences that left the hotel industry shaken in its boots. They not only created a distinctly unique human experience that had never been created for, for travelers to have more intimate experiences with guests, but they also created a new experience for people with excess real estate to monetize it. This ended up being, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of an $80 billion a year business and spawned an echo boom of other aspects of the economy that copied the sharing economy. First principles, allow us to take really simple challenges and turn them into transformative experiences. Now, we're gonna try this, right? So roughly, this is what we look like. There's not always two essential elements or two defined assumptions or two conventions to break. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna break into groups and to temper expectations, Sorry, we're gonna take on the challenge of getting CX unstuck, but that is not gonna be our challenge frame. What we're gonna ask is that you as team members, when you get into your breakout groups, we want you to start by generating, and the instructions are on the digital whiteboard you'll be directed to. We want you to start by writing a statement of a, a way that you've seen CX get stuck in your business or in your practice. And each team will then start by writing those, and then you'll go from there. Now. Be warned when you drop into this mural board, it's a little intimidating at first. I'm not sure exactly how Alistair and Tom are gonna to get you moving. The instructions at the top are for everybody. Then you'll find your individual whiteboards based on your team breakouts and you'll build these out. We'll come back and talk about them. Uh, one note is 
I think we'll do the voting specifically on the challenge frame that your teams decide on in number in question number one. So we'll do the voting to drive the discussion based on the different challenge frames that the teams come up with. And then that's how we'll select where this is going. Uh, Tom, Alistair, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. So, um, so Bob, to answer your question, no, you do not need a you do not need a account. Uh, you can go in as a visitor. Um, and so, what we're going to do is Tom's going to Tom Dewitt is going to break you up into uh, rooms. Uh, and depending on which room you go into, uh, please pick the Canvas number associated with your room. You're going to go through. You're going to frame your challenge with your team, and then you're gonna step through each of these uh, elements and assumptions and then uh, breaking the convention. And finally, if you can get to number five, uh, that would be awesome. But I think one, two, and three are the most important pieces uh, for our discussion today. Um, if you can get to four and five, uh, that would be awesome. So uh, we're gonna give you 15 minutes um, please uh, introduce each other, uh, introduce yourselves to your team members, um, and then get started. So, Tom, has, uh, have you whisked them away? Yeah, has everybody been able to access the mural? Um, I, I dropped it in the chat. Has everybody been able to access? If not, let me know. Okay. So, I'm going to I'm gonna uh, break you up into nine different rooms. So, please note the breakout room that you're going into and then gravitate towards um, the, the board that reflects that number. And we will see you guys in 15 minutes. Okay. All right. So, go ahead, Tom. Elsa, queue them up for the voting. Yeah. So, what we're going to do, um, as, uh, as Tom talked about, um, as we were going in, um, we're going to have you go back in um, and take a look at the top line. What is the the frame? The, what is the challenge that each uh, that each team decided to go with? Um, we're going to give you the opportunity to vote on each of those, um, and you should decide what is the what are your top three choices. Um, we'll give you five minutes to do that, and uh, once that's been done. Uh, we'll all come back and uh, Tom and I will uh, talk about uh, what you all have chosen. So with that, Tom, okay, I'm, hit the start. I just started it. Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll fill the space here as people are, are finalizing this. Um, it's really interesting uh, to put a, a like kind of a bigger challenge out here. And part of this is just seeing where people's heads are at, right? So there's a method. But even just what we expose in what are people running into, um, I think I think sets us up for an interesting discussion. They're all, I mean, we could probably, for those of us that were at the conference a week or two ago, um, I think a lot of the topics that I see emerge on the board were addressed in some way, shape, or form. And uh, so as we as we look at this moving forward, part of the question is, is, is it about picking one of these? Is, is solving one of them? the silver bullet solution and doing it really well? Or is it just too all jumbled? Do we de need a like a better structure around this? Or like, I don't know, right? But, but, but I think it's time for us to have a conversation to use the metaphor from, you know, from the story that I started with, of are we even driving the right kind of vehicle? Um, and to start to think about maybe, maybe we got to go at this a little bit differently. So, so that's kind of where I think we'll go in, in closing. Uh, I'll build on that idea a little bit. But first, I'm eager to hear what a couple people had. So, Alistair, I'll, I'll kick it back to you as the votes come in to, to direct yep. the conversation. Yeah, no, I think we're good, um, Tom. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and close out the voting here. A big one, I think, uh, Tom, is that we all I think that we can all agree on um, is, you know, leadership, leadership, not understanding you know, what, what actually is CX and what is that impact that CX will have, you know, on, on our business? Yeah. So, uh, did you guys hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, we couldn't hear you. We couldn't see which one got the most votes. It was just a white block. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, I have no the, idea. Folks voted on the canvas itself. It's a. It's totally fine. Okay. Um, but the 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 biggest in terms of the vote was the the leadership does not understand what CX means. <laughs> which canvas was that, Alistair? Um, let me. I will tell you right away. Hold on. So. So so uh, what I'd love to do is get get the team, whichever team kind of framed this as the challenge to quickly take us through um, how they built out their board and kind of what assumptions emerged and how you challenged some of those. So that was Canvas 6, and it was me and Carl and Sue. Um, and Sue had to leave, so I can speak for us and then Carl jump in. Um, so... Yeah, that that leadership not understanding what CX means was kind of the theme through almost every single thing that we started talking about when we were trying to frame. And then we started to break it down into different elements. And then the ones that came through um, for us as the critical ones are lack of alignment on priorities between what leadership thinks is the priority and what the CX team or CX um, staff believes. So that was one element, um, not understanding the ROI that's being delivered from CX. And then the third one uh, was lack of patience to see those outcomes. So trying to rush it uh, when it takes time to, to get it right. And we didn't make it to assumptions, but. Okay, well, that's, I mean, I, I think those are, those are all relevant uh, comments, right? Lack of alignment. It's really hard to get alignment in CX, right? Because is it its own thing? Uh, what's the basis of alignment? Uh, and one of the things I saw on one of the other boards was, uh, you know, people make assumptions about their customers. So is, is sh should the should the alignment happen through a metric? Should it happen through a source? Uh, should it happen through a body of research, quant or qual? Uh, these are the types of things that, that we have to figure out. And I think the more that we don't have an industry standard, the more it confuses people as they do it themselves. Organizations are gonna pick, but I, I guess I'll posture a provocation, something we can talk about or table. Like, should we? Should we be defining like a foundational element of alignment as a professional practice, like a community of customer experience practitioners and say, it should always be tracked this way, or like this should always be part of the alignment conversation. Do we need some sort of established thing so we're not working against each other? We're collectively. I don't know the answer. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is, this is I think it's very interesting. I, I come from a B2B uh, background, um, and I think it varies on not only whether you are B2B or B2C, but also the industry in and of itself. Um, and so we can set, I think you can, from my perspective, you can certainly set the parameters at the very top level um, and sort of think, think through, um, here are the 15 metrics that we, we could propose as, a, as CX professionals, but what are the right metrics for your company um, are going to be specific to you. There's no okay, everybody is going to focus on, you know, NRR, GRR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the list. Now what works best for you? That's my, my personal belief. And as I'm, you know, as I'm talking to new companies, understanding from their perspective, what they're currently tracking um, and how I might suggest additional metrics or other metrics that they should be looking at. Alistair, I would say I would say even before you get into metrics, I think you have to take it up a notch. Um, I think we, we all know as CX practitioners that CX doesn't have a chance of survival and getting embedded if it's not aligned with the very top of the house's key top objectives, right? So if you start with there, because you're not you're not going to have CX necessarily change the, uh, the the top two, three, four things that the CEO and the management team want to do, right? You have to kind of be aware of and in bed with what those corporate mandates are, and they do shift from time to time, but you need to be aligned with them 
or else there's no chance of alignment and getting traction. Yeah, and 100%. on that note, um, what I'm what I saw on the chat, um, we got eleven votes on Canvas nine. nine yeah. That looks like the challenge there is connecting CX to business results. If, um, is that correct, Matt? Colin? What I I went through and did a quick count, just then all the votes scattered, and I put a little chat in there. Looking nine and six, yeah, both so like we, fifteen. Yeah. So. Canvas nine, Tom, it actually transitions perfectly to what Rich was just uh, was just bringing up. Um, and and Rich, my my uh, argument back at you would be that if you've got a chief customer officer or a chief experience officer sitting at the at the table, you absolutely have got the ability to change what those three or four top goals are. But now it's how do we get that person there? Yeah, and a lot of companies don't have the benefit of the C-suite representation. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. deeper down in the organization, so you have to fight for a relevance. <laughs> 100%. Can I, I just want to add quickly on this, that if we need a framework or not, um, I think the benefit, and Tom, close your ears, it's a benefit to the program that you've created at, at Michigan State, putting validity behind the profession. So CX has kind of been organically grown, right? You started in, anyway, there's many entry points into being a customer experience professional. And so it doesn't necessarily get the same buy-in as somebody who has gone to um, get their MBA or maybe they're a CPA, right? People understand clearly what that is. And it's not that every organization is gonna use the same model, but being able to pull from a structure of, hey, these are things that work in our industry to drive those business results. I think it is important to our long-term professional success as CX professionals. So, can, can I add to that? Yes, that I think, I'm sorry. If I could just add to that, that I think that's so critical because I think respecting that CX is a practice, a discipline, and there, you know, it's not this fluffy, squishy thing, is very important because what I often hear is people love using the phrase customer experience. They'll put it in their strategies, they'll do all the things. It will be a part of the overarching strategies, but I cannot tell you the countless amount of initiatives that actually has no CX representation within the project itself. Because the DX, UX, the whoever X people are involved, but they're not really tapping in to the true CX professionals to bring that CX discipline and rigor to the thing that they're actually touting as a CX effort. Yeah. Everyone misses the one of the, one of the <laughs> whoops, I'm sorry. I mean, no, some real truth bombs there, but I mean, one area that would probably add to that also is it's incredibly hard uh, to really do CX. Oh. Right? And I think part of the challenge that I've been sort of hypothesizing in, in my space is, is that, you know, are, are we treating CX as a product? And, and what I mean by that, if anybody is a product manager or has worked in the product space, they might understand that a little bit more, but just help me, just, just work with me for a second. In I work in the product space, in the design space. So we write requirements, you know, if you want to tap on this button, this, this happens. If you want the customer to do this, this is where they go. And then, you know, you plan that all out. CX is full of emotions. CX is full of decisions with a little microcosm, you know, aspects, whether you're going to make me wait in a QE for 20 or 30 minutes, and then you still expect me to be happy um, to other areas of what you're telling me right now is not really resonating as to what you're listening to because you're meeting a criteria. And so I think the challenge there is if the reality is, is that human emotion and human behaviors can actually be defined and charted and, def and you know have a logic to them a little bit more to where if you could map those out and you could define them and treat those as products, like we want to just make people a little bit happier when they're in a call queue or you know responding to a customer service inquiry or whatnot. Whatever that might be, if you define that a little bit more finitely and you start treating that as a product, you know, and try to, you know, evaluate and, and measure it, then it can become a little bit more real to that. That is normally very abstract to senior leadership. And Patty, looks Thank like you. you had your hand up next. I did because, you know, Thomas is a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, but I just have to say that if, until we as CX people can learn to speak the language of business, 
we are going to set ourselves up to fail. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that assumption came from that we think everybody should understand us. We're the people who should understand everybody else. We're the people who should have more empathy. We're the people who should be more relational. And we need to be able to do that as CX professionals. And we need to speak the language of the business to people. It's not business leaders' job to understand NPS or CSAT or CES or any of the things it is that we do. It's our job to understand them and to make sure that we are aligned with where the company is going, what the company objectives are, and what the company strategy is. Very well, well said. Yeah. Looks like, um, Lou, I'm going to defer to Lindsay because it's always ladies first, and then you're after Lindsay, all right? And, we, and we, we've got, and then we'll have to move, turn it back to Tom just to close this out. So okay. go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, because I, I've got a little bit of devil, devil's advocacy, because Patty, while in spirit, I agree with what you said, holistically, in execution, I don't see that being a reality, because what I encounter are a lot of business leads, executives, even VC boards who are like, hey, um, design has no place in business. Well, the whole point of a business is to sell a thing, sell a thing that solves a problem for a group of people. That is design. Solving a problem is designing. So yes, we as CX professionals, any of the XD professions, part of what our job is to do is to understand, gain empathy and help translate that empathy back in. But when there has been a systematic change in the function of business where design is a paintbrush to be purchased on the side and applied in a modicum as needed or as expected, it becomes more of that education gap of, yes, we need to be there to empathize with them, but also helping to open the eyes of the different executives that design is more fun fundamental and foundational. And we have forgotten that in this country. All right, Lou, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you 30 seconds and then I'm going to give, give it back to Tom. I really think we have to go back to the very beginning and look at where CX has gone, which is literally a bolt on to industrial age thinking. There's been no, in, there's been no, hardly any innovation. Some of the biggest innovation was what, NS, NPS score, that it's an innovation, but no one understands it, no one believes in it. I think the greatest thing that's happened to foster innovation by giving people a well-rounded understanding and the future innovators to me are the people that are actually seeking further knowledge, understanding human behavior, understanding what the practices are today. And I think Tom and what's been done at MSU is literally the beginning of a movement to think of it as a way of doing business versus a bunch of bolt on crap. You know. All right. So I think that's my cue. Yeah. Um, to, to try to wrap things up. What a what a great collection of, of comments. Uh, I mean, so so many, I wish I could I touch on them and, and connect them one at a time. Um, everybody made a good point. And I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think we need to have a right answer today. But what I hear in the room is a collective frustration. Like, it seems like what I'm feeling isn't, I'm not alone, right? Like, those of us that have been at this for a while, we're like, we got to do better. No matter how good we're doing in this instance or that instance, we got to do better. So, so I think this is, this is a beginning, hopefully, of a conversation of us to hold ourselves and our work to a higher standard. In that regard, the people who are new to this might be the most valuable people in the room because they're the ones who can challenge the way we've done things and say, well, why, why are you doing it that way? That, that doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, what if we did it this way? What if we uh, reframed it? Um, my point of view is that uh, we got to tear it down uh, in order to build it back up. And and I, I guess I'll I'll, uh, I'll kind of pull this up on screen as I talk through it. Drive a few closing thoughts here. All right, 
we're stuck. Uh, we're collectively acknowledging the idea that we are stuck. And uh, to me, we've got to acknowledge what it is we're chasing. So, so part of this is just refocusing around that. My opinion, my point of view, which you don't all have to agree with, but I'll at least put it out there for you to reflect on. I believe that like the reason I do customer experience for a living is because I believe it's a better way to run a business. It's the only way I can find to run a business that, first of all, satisfies its employees by delivering meaningful work. Second of all, it delivers satisfied customers by putting experiences into the world that they care about. And third, it satisfies shareholders by delivering better than market results. And it does all three at the same time sustainably when it's institutionalized. On the rare instance that we actually get it right, this is the only way to run a business that balances the three primary stakeholders in any business. And that might be part of the case to the C-suite, right? Instead of being like, oh, it's about EX. Oh no, it's about CX. Oh no, it's about shareholder experience. I know some of you have had that conversation, right? Um, so, so we got to figure out what is the ecosystem of experiences that an organization puts into the world and how do they break down under those? I have sat in rooms with companies that are 10, $15 million into their CX spend and asked simple questions like, great, what experiences do you make? Can you list them? What are the customer experiences you make? What are they made of? Millions of dollars in, and they have no idea. We got to get back to basic essentials, basic, basic conversations, like things like this. So, so the challenge that we face is, is to acknowledge that we're at a new beginning, um, and being stuck is that new beginning. So I want to jump back to the story that I started with, being stuck in this minivan, and tell you how that ended, and maybe it helps us get over this hump moving forward too. So the way we got out of this bind was we put two guys sitting or kind of uh, crouching on the hood of the minivan, another guy pushing on the grill of the van, me driving with a car in reverse. And the two guys on the hood kind of bounced up and down until the front tires made contract and I hit the gas in reverse, right? And we jumped the car off of the roof. Uh, no human beings were injured in the incident, but the car was. <laughs> Not catastrophically, but uh, we went home back to the hotel. We didn't get to the girl that day. We went back to the hotel and then we didn't give up. We didn't, we didn't say this is it, but we did start rethinking the problem. We, we didn't go through it formally, but we refocused on what we were trying to accomplish. We refocused on saying, we're here to see the wild side of Yosemite. How do we make that happen? And we defined some essential elements. We defined the assumptions. And we started saying things like, well, do we really need, do we really need a four-wheel drive vehicle from a rental car company or could we ride horses? Like, what if we didn't rent something? What if we bought something? What if we bought an old four by four and we just donated it to the scrapyard at the end of the trip? So all of a sudden these options started to open. But it started by explicitly defining those assumptions, breaking them explicitly. And what happened was this. I wanna thank the rental car company, Avis, if you're on the call. Uh, I wanna thank them because we ended up with one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had because the rental car company kind of hosed us. So we had to design our own experience. We had to break down the elements of what are we really trying to accomplish? tear it down to its bare essentials. And not only did we get unstuck, we completed our objective and we had a hell of a time in the process. This is one of the best trips I've ever had. And I think it's important for us to remember that as customer experience professionals, it's easy to get trapped in journey models and personas and things like that. At the end of the day, there's two things we're doing. We're untangling complexity across our organizations, simplifying, and we're turning our businesses into uniquely compelling human experiences that people give a shit about. They wanna be a part of, no matter which side of what we do that's on. So 
that's where I'm at. I encourage anybody who wants to keep talking about this, please reach out. I, I think we need to fix this and I'm planning on spending at least the next decade working on it. So if you're in, I'm in, let's talk about it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, cool. I, I think you stuff. need to write up exactly how you got into those uh, four four wheelers, because uh, my youngest son would certainly love to do that through uh, through Yosemite for sure. So, um, all right. Well, well, thanks, Tom. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, I'm happy to announce um, a lot of you were at the conference a couple of weeks ago and really fell in love with Sandra Thompson. Um, and I promised them that we would get her on a round table soon. And she agreed to be here next month. And she used Aristotle too, Tom. Um, uh, I believe you did earlier. But yeah, what Aristotle taught us about CX and EX, Sandra is really interactive. Um, you're you're going to love working with her. She specializes in emotional intelligence. She's uh, from the UK. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you guys next month on the 21st, just before Christmas.